Okay, we are very grateful to have uh, Alba Soto from uh, Brookhaven National Lab um, speaking the, the seminar, the equal theory seminar on unraveling the inner structure of jets with dynamical grooming. Please, Alba, thank you. Hi, so, uh, hi everybody, and thank you for the invitation. And yeah, today I'm going to speak about the inner structure of jets with dynamical grooming and a couple of disclaimers before I go into the talk. This is not a heavy ion talk in principle, so this is going to remain on the PP side of things. And we will see only the heavy ion part at the very end. And the reason for that is that well, we wanted to benchmark the method first in proton proton collisions and then move to heavy ions once we understand it a little bit better. And this work uh, have already resulted in two publications with Yasin, so the guy that spoke yesterday in this same forum, and Conrad, both of them very well known in Santiago. And the second disclaimer, I forgot. Ah, yeah, the second one is that uh, the introduction is kind of dense because Max asked for an introduction for students, so I obey to him. Maybe it's a little bit too simple for uh, many of you, but I hope uh, it's a good way to settle down the scene. So let me start uh, by explaining actually the words in the title. So I'm going to start by jets, then I will move to the, their inner structure. And then at the end of the talk, I will explain what is dynamical grooming. So let me go to the next slide, where I, uh, as I promised, I start from the very basics. That is how uh, QCD jets emerge from quark and gluons. So we start with a PP collision at the LHC, for example, and then we, what we will have is a parton being kicked out from the proton and interacting with another parton, exchanging, for example, a gluon at the TEV scale. And this quark-quark interaction will produce, in principle, a pair of back-to-back -back um, bars. This process, the uh, matrix element for, to compute this process is calculable in perturbative QCD up to, in this case of digits, uh, next to next to leading order is the state of the art right now. And of course, this uh, hard scattering uh, amplitude has to be convoluted with a uh, convol sorry with the part on distribution function. Now the point is what happens to this quark once it has been produced, right? So it starts, it is produced at the TV scale, but we know that in the detector we are going to observe hadrons whose masses are characterized by MEVs. So how does it go from the TEV scale to the MEV scale? And this is done through parton branching. So the parton reduces its virtuality but via successive branches. So if one would compute the first one to two splitting, assuming that this uh, parton here, I'm not uh, saying whether it is a quark or a gluon, this guy is on shell and carries a momentum transfer PT. That is more or less the energy and more or less the virtuality in which it was produced. Now it's going to split into two other partons at an opening angle theta, and uh, both of them are going to share a momentum fraction, C, and by conservation, this is going to be 1 minus C. So if I compute the probability for this process to happen, this is going to be proportional to the splitting function, Altarelli Paris splitting function, and then the strong coupling that comes here in the vertex and a phase uh, space factor. So if I take the leading contribution to the splitting function, this would give me a one over C. And at the end, I see that the phase space for this probability, for this splitting to happen, uh, contains a small factor that is the coupling, but this is compensated by the divergent structure of this uh, kinematic uh, phase space, where we see that we have the collinear and soft divergences of QCD. What this is telling us, is that subsequent emissions are going to be greatly enhanced because essentially this factor is of order one or bigger and that all of them are more or less similar except for the fact that the coupling runs. Another important fact of how this part of branching happens is that the emissions are in a semi-classical picture angular order and this is due to the fact to the phenomenon called color coherence, in which the Santiago group has strongly contributed to understand this, especially in heavy ions. And this tells us that if you have a second splitting from either the quark leg or the anti-quark leg that is happening at an angle larger than the QQ bar pair, this uh, splitting is going to be actually sensitive to the total color charge. So to the initiating parton and not to the legs themselves because the, uh, this splitting is not able to resolve the two legs themselves, but is as if it happened from 
the initiating pattern. Therefore, our branching are going to be angular uh, order. So the next emission is going to be at an angle smaller than the first emission. With these uh, two elements, we can already construct what we call a jet in theory. So let me replace by this single pattern that I had before. Now it's going to be more a cone-like structure. And this cone-like structure can be understood from the fact that the emissions are highly collimated. So it's very tentative to put a cone around uh, this pattern shower. And all the branches, as I said, go from the TV scale to lambda QCD. So we are exploring widgets, a whole range of a scale. Now, how this picture matches what we see in experiment, that is a collimated string of particles or tracks uh, in the calorimeter. So these are pictures from CMS or Atlas that you have all seen. And of course, the natural question is how these two things come together. Because in principle, you have your event at the LHC. Now, what do you decide that comes inside this cone? And to do that, what we need is an operational definition of a jet that are clustering algorithms. That, as I said, provide a way to enable theory to data comparison. The logic behind these clustering algorithms is actually to invert the QCD branching process. And what we do is pairwise clustering of particles. That minimizes this metric that exploits the infrared and collinear divergences of QCD. So essentially, you have the PTs of the particles, an exponent alpha that is a free parameter and the angular distance. Depending on the choice of alpha, you will end up with a different clustering history. So the three most common uh, clustering algorithms are Cambridge-Gagen, where you said here uh, alpha equals zero. So you are clustering only based on the angular distance among the particles. And this is what I am showing here. So this would be a set of emissions order in angle and in PT. And this is how the clustering process would proceed. And this Cambridge-Gagen algorithm, we will use it extensively along this talk because it's ideal for substructure measurements, right? So it's angular order in your tree, essentially. Now, the KT is sensitive to soft activity because you said here alpha equals to 1, so you start from soft to hard. And the anti-KT is basically the opposite, so you said here minus 1. And it would be ideal for identifying candidate jets. So how would you proceed at the LHC? You would cluster your particles with an anti-KT and a given radius r, and this would give you how many jets uh, did you have in your event. And this is how would you compare theory to experiment. Now, with these two things, we got to start uh, computing uh, observables. But let me mention first that this uh, jet process that I just described, it doesn't occur isolated at hadronic colliders. There are a few other, most of them non-perturbative contributions to the process that I just said that pollute our both calculations and our measurements, and I was, um, I, as I will show you in a bit. So this is the same process that I showed before. And the first thing that we uh, need to take into account is that uh, we don't observe partons, but hadrons. So at a given scale and QCD, the things inside our cone, the degrees of freedom that we have inside our cone are no longer gluons and quarks, but pions, kaons, and whatnot. And this we don't know how to compute in PQCD, so it will induce uh, some uncertainty in our measurements. Another fact that we need to take into account, especially at the LHC and the future high luminosity phase, is that per, ben per bunch crossing of protons, we don't have only one PP interaction, but we can have several occurring more or less simultaneously. So it could happen that in your jet, where you are interested in a particular PP collision, particles from another PP collision end up there. And this uh, will, of course, pollute what you call a jet in this case. Just to give you a number, this number of pileup interactions is around 60 at LHC colliders. That is already quite a high number, but it will increase dramatically for the high luminosity phase where we are expecting to reach 200 pileup uh, interactions per, heart, per bunch crossing. So this is going to be one of the dominant sources of um, uncertainties in jet analysis in the future high luminosity LHC. So how do you uh, make sure that only particles coming from one PP interaction end up in your jet? Another uh, thing is that the partons that enter your collision can have initial state radiation. So before they enter the collision, they can also radiate as in the same way as they do after the collision. And finally, the multi-parton interactions account for the fact that not only we can have one part on part on, uh, one part on from each proton interacting, but actually we can have a couple of them, or in general, multiple. 
So these two, and this will lead to a similar phenomenon that at the end in your jet cone, you end up with particles coming from different uh, parton interactions. These two things all together will be called underlying event in the rest of the talk. And I will study them differently. So the hadronization, the pileup, and the underlying event. So now that we more or less know what a jet is, um, both in theory and in experiment, we can start uh, using them to learn something about uh, physics. And one way to use them as a tool is to search for new particles, or in general for a particle, let's call it X. So if imagine that you have a resonance X and it decays hadronically. So it goes to a QQ bar, and this QQ bar will emerge in your calorimeter as a couple of jets. So what you would do is reconstruct the digit mass spectrum and look for a bump at a given mass, at the mass of the resonance. So this has been traditionally done since, well, for every collider. And in this case, I uh, chose a plot from the 90s where CERN had a PP bar collider, so a proton-antiproton collider, and this was one of the detectors called uh, UH2. And what they were looking at was a W decaying to a QQ bar. So they wanted to see a bump around the mass of the W. And essentially they did that, but precisely reconstructing these two jets and computing the mass spectrum. That this is what I'm showing here. And they were looking for to resolve the W and the Z, but the resolution of their uh, detectors was not big enough. So they had like a peak coming from the combination of these two channels. So essentially from top to bottom, what you have is the data are the points, and then the black line is a fit to the background, so to all the other processes that can contribute to this kind of search. And at the bottom panel, you have background plus the signal, so it nicely accommodates a bump around the W and set masses. So this has been how many particles have been discovered uh, so far. Uh, now, 30 years later, Atlas has taken this game to a whole new level by uh, applying weekly supervised machine learning techniques where they, instead of doing a model dependent search, so where you know exactly what you are looking at is the W and it decays to a QQ bar. Instead of doing that, they have done a generic search. So you have a resonance A going to a resonance B and C. And you don't know the, if this is a standard model particle or if it's a beyond the standard model particle. And the only thing you need to know, and then the V will decay subsequently to a jet and the C the same. And what they have tried is to take the data and look for anomalies based on the invariant mass of this spectrum, but in a model agnostic way. And this is an example where they, they, they did this kind of plots to check that the anomaly detection neural network was working. So they have the masses of the two resonances. And in this case, they injected artificially on the data a very small signal where this resonance had three, whereas a 3 TeV and these other two on the GeV scale. So it was injected here, precisely. And what you see around uh, this cross is how the neural network reacted to the signal, and you see that um, it was able to catch it. Right? So low efficiency in this plot is that there is a signal-like region. So now they are uh, just reanalyzing their data with this kind of model agnostic uh, tools. So you see that the field has substantially progressed from the 90s to uh, 2020. Now, a particular regime is when the particle that you are looking at is on the electroweak scale. Why? Because I'm always talking about the LHC, right? Why? Because the LHC energy is on the TeV scale, right? So 10 to the 4 GeV. And this is way larger than the electroweak scale. So the top, the Higgs, the W, all of these particles have a mass of around 100 GeV. What this produces is that the resonances or the particles are produced in a highly boosted regime. So, and one way to see this is imagine that again, you have a particle X decaying uh, to gloom, so it couples to the regular um, QCD degrees of freedom, and the angle among these gluons can be easily computed to go as the mass of the resonance divided by the PT. Now, when the PT, that is gonna be roughly the energy of the collision, is way higher than the mass of your, of your resonance, then this angle is going to be very small. Therefore, these decaying products, you are not going to be able to resolve anymore these two jets that I showed you here, where the PT was of the order of the mass, but rather you are going to 
reconstruct this decaying products as one single large radius jet. And what's the problem with this? Is that then, how do you distinguish this kind of new physics signal from the regular QCD background that where you have the soft and collinear singularities and therefore the decaying products are always collimated. So this is going to be one of the central questions of this talk and that is how to distinguish this kind of new signal, uh, new, uh, new particle signal from the QCD background. And one obvious thing would be, okay, still, if you are not able to resolve the two jets, you can take this jet and measure the mass. And the mass of this jet should be identical to the resonance while in the QCD case, we know that there is no intrinsic escape, so the mass distribution is like a flat, well, not flat, but a smooth distribution. While this should be a peak around the resonance mass. What's the problem with that strategy? That the jet mass is highly sensitive to all the non-perturbative contributions that I described a couple of slides before. So if, for example, you take a W, as I said, instead of a particle X, let's say it's a W, and you go to QQ bar. So if you take PIFIA and simulate this kind of jets at the partonic level, you see that the mass that you get is highly peaked at the resonance value. So this would be fantastic. However, when you switch on hadronization and also the underlying event, so remember that this was this multi-parton interaction and the initial state radiation, all these uh, soft uh, emissions lead to a smearing of the mass distribution that makes it harder to distinguish it from the QCD mass that I, I am showing here on the right has a very similar distribution. Also, the QCD mass is highly affected by this, um, by this phenomena. So again, now we take a QCD jet and plot the part of level mass and then start switching on some uh, corrections to it. So we switch on hadronization and we see that the peak moves and the distribution, in this case, narrows. And uh, the underlying event also produces a shift in the distribution. For larger values of the mass, this is the fixed order calculation, so you don't see any difference here because it's a very perturbative regime. But then when you go to the slow value, to the small values of the mass, then you start seeing differences. So not only you can do this in Monte Carlo, but actually in data. Where they did, what they did in Atlas a few years ago was to take the jet mass with different levels of pileup. So the blue one would be the less contaminated jet mass distribution with pileup, and then you start increasing the number of pileup vertices, and you see that the mass completely shifts and broadens. Therefore, the jet mass discriminating power is, uh, is not very high. So you need to do better than that. So if you, you want to identify a boosted object, like the W from the abundant QCD background, you cannot just plot the mass distributions for the W and the QCD jets and say, okay, I put a cut in the mass around the uh, W mass peak. And then I will say that all the jets that have this mass are coming from a W and the rest are coming for the QCD. Because if you do that, you see that you have a high contamination coming uh, from QCD. And not only that, but this way, these guys are way more abundant than the, job, than the W. So this actually can go... Uh, up. So then how do we proceed? How do we try to distinguish these two processes? And the first idea is, okay, not, don't take only like global properties of your jet, but look inside it and properties such as the radiation pattern that is going to be different for a colorless object. For example, let's take a Higgs. If now the Higgs goes to a QQ bar, this momentum sharing fraction between these two guys is going to be symmetric while for a quark initiated jet, the momentum sharing fraction distribution is going to be given by the Altarelli Pares splitting function that we know is not a flat function at all. So, therefore, this thing is going to be asymmetric while this is uh, symmetric. So, this one be one option to look inside the jet and exploit the difference between the radiation pattern. Another option is to keep going, to keep pursuing this kind of distinction between the W jets and the QCD jets using the mass. But then you need to find a way to remove all the spurious contributions coming from the underlying event, hadronization, pileup, and so on. And what all these emissions have in common is that they are soft and they are wide angle. So the idea is to groom them away. And this is the goal of what is called grooming techniques. And it's going to be um, mainly the, the goal of this talk. 
The third option is uh, give it to a computer and let it distinguish the WJET to a QCD background using, for example, the loom planes, as we will see in a bit, that they are quite different from both of them. And then this was proposed by these authors down here. So if I'm going to start by doing a JET substructure, the way, a convenient way to represent the all the parton uh, radiation inside my jet is by using the loom plane that has uh, was proposed uh, quite a few years ago but became popular actually only very recently well it became popular again so it was popular at that time and now it became uh, a very useful tool both in proton proton and in heavy ion collision so how to depict the space time picture of a jet in this kind of two dimensional representation is by taking each emission in a jet, as we will see now, and describe, uh, describe it by its kt and is uh, the inverse of its angle. So essentially what we are doing is exploiting the two QCD singularities, right? So the collinear one and the soft one. And how this thing will proceed is that you start with a highly energetic parton that, start emitting, that starts emitting other partons at a given formation time that is given by this formula. And these formation times goes uh, from a very broad range of scale, uh, bounded essentially by lambda QCD and the virtuality of your initiating parting. So each emission would be represented as a point here in the loom plane, and we can then proceed. In a semi-classical picture, we will keep the angular ordering, so we are decreasing con uh, the angle constantly, and this would be the third emission that I have here. Now, if I would stop here, this would be considering only the emissions for the primary branch, so from the hard parton, and this is what I will call the primary loom plane. So just following the hardest branch and taking into account its emissions. But now these emissions can also emit, and this would be represented as secondary loom planes coming out of the primary one. So this would be the phase space for this emission to happen, and that emission can also emit. So at the end you have like a collection of uh, leaves, people call it, or well, different primary, secondary, and tertiary loop plates. And this goes on essentially forever until you reach the hadronization scale. So this is my loom diagram, and this would be the way of looking at substructure because it contains everything, actually. So it would be the substructure observable. Now, only recently, as I said, it has been proposed to access it in experimental data, so to measure this um, in real life. How do you do that? Then you need uh, to use what I mentioned at the very beginning, that are jet uh, reconstruction algorithms, uh, in particular Cambry Gagen. So the way to go is to recluster your jet with Cambry Gagen, therefore you have an angular order tree, and to undo the last clustering step. So you have your full jet, and then you undo it, so you end up with two subjets, each of them with momentum PT1, PT2, and at a given angle theta. And each of these uh, so this uh, branching step is going to be characterized by set, that is the momentum sharing fraction between these two, and the opening angle. And then if you want to do only the primary loom plane, you are going to iterate this process, but following only the hardest branch. Doing this, you end up with a set of coordinates of set, of set and theta values that populate your loom plane. So this is for QCD jets in Monte Carlo using PCA. And the color coding represents like the density of points. Remember that the phase space probability for this splitting uh, at leading log could be written like this, right? So you only have the two variables that you are plotting. So this would be essentially, this is log of C theta and then one over the angle. So at leading log, the phase space would be uniformly populated but you see that this is not the case, right? So there are a lot of uh, structures emerging here. The most prominent one probably is the red band that we see here, and this is just coming from the running and the coupling. So the running, uh, the coupling runs with KT, and this is what we see this increase over here. Uh, and the rest of the different regions are coming from non-perturbative contributions, so multi-parton interaction, underlying event, and so on and so forth. And you can also distinguish very easily what, where is the perturbative radiation that would be above lambda QCD and the non-perturbative emissions that are below lambda QCD. So this cannot only be done 
in Monte Carlo, but also in data. And this is very recent by Atlas. They measure, uh, they measure the long plane. And what I'm showing here is a projection. So instead of taking the full density distribution, you just make a cut for a given angle. And so you take a slice, and what they compare is different Monte Carlos using uh, models for hadronization, angular ordering, uh, sorry, for the evolution variable in the shower, and so on and so forth. And you see that it can actually distinguish between all the main three Monte Carlos that are used uh, almost indistinguishably in proton proton collisions, so Pythia, Sherpa, and Herwig. You see that this shows uh, some differences. So, this is a very, the loom plane is a very powerful tool to constrain Monte Carlo generators and also in heavy ions, for example, to see where the radiation uh, is going after the medium interactions. Another point of the loom plane is that observables are substructure observables are represented mostly as lines, right? So, if, for example, if I go back, uh, well, here I can do it, right? So, if I would compute the jet mass, this would be a line in the loom plane. So a line of constant jet mass would be, yeah, would give me the mass. The second option, so with this, with these loom planes, I can try again to distinguish QCD and W jets, because if I would plot the loom plane for the W jets, it would look completely different. And I can feed a machine learning algorithm with QCD jets images and W images and distinguish uh, both of them. So this would be a way of solving the problem. Remember that I had in mind of separating signal from the background. The second option that I proposed was to remain, to keep on using the mass as a discriminator, but a modified mass. Not the plain mass, but removing some of the emissions that contaminate uh, your determination of the mass. And this is done by so-called grooming techniques that, uh, as I said a few slides, but as a reminder, they remove soft and wide angle radiation from the reconstructed jet. Now, in proton-proton collisions, what we are trying to do is minimize the impact of all the contributions that I said in order to enhance the sensitivity to beyond the standard model searches or constrain Monte Carlos. For the heavy ion sites, on top of this non-perturbative PPFX, we also have the thermal background. So we also want to minimize the sensitivity to that in order to, for example, understand what is the QGP effect on the splitting function, that is a substructure observable, uh, identify the QGP angular resolution and in more generic terms, pin down medium response. But at the end of the day, what grooming techniques achieve is to enable theory to data comparisons without the need of a Monte Carlo. So pick QCD against data. Now, how does uh, grooming proceed in particular the most famous strategies? One of the pioneers in 2010 was, uh, is called trimming. Uh, the, num the names are always pretty funky in this literature. So uh, how does streaming proceed? So you start with a jet. This I am presenting the jet like I see from the top. And now you recluster it with a smaller scale. That is called this R soup. So at the end, from one jet, you are able to obtain four subjects. Now you are going to discard all the subjects whose PT is below a certain threshold, where you are clearly looking for the hardcore part of the jet to remove the soft and wide angle radiation. So here you are removing the, you are uh, trying to constrain the angular distribution and here you are constraining the momentum. So after isolating the hardcore of your jet, then you expect the mass to, uh, the mass peak to be less sensitive to all the contributions that I uh, told you before. So I already showed this plot where I was just computing, well, Atlas computed the jet mass for different levels of pileup. Now, if you take these same jets and apply a trimming procedure, then the mass is no longer sensitive to pileup. So if you are able to isolate the hardcore of the jet, then your sensitivity to this contamination is highly reduced. So this is one option using uh, trimming. The most popular one, however, um, is not trimming, but it's called soft drop. And I guess you already have heard of this, but just in case, what you do is uh, start with a Cambric Agen 3, as always, and then you start going through, uh, traveling through your branches until you find one splitting that satisfies this condition. So the momentum sharing fraction is larger than a given. Uh, cut, so C cut, 
times the angle to the power of beta. Now, zika and beta are free parameters, so once you have found this splitting in your Cambridge-Gagen history, then you groom away all uh, the branches occurring at larger angles. So then your jet is composed at the end of the day of, your group jet is composed at the end of the day of two subjects, separated by an angle of distance, theta g, and sharing a moment of fraction, uh, cg. Now, what is the meaning of this parameter beta? Actually, if you set it to zero, and then you are imposing a cut only on the moment of fraction, this was introduced already in 2008, and it's called uh, mass drop tagger. However, if you start tuning uh, beta, then you would, uh, if you put it to minus infinity, it would be the more aggressive grooming. Essentially, you are destroying your jet completely. Now, if you put beta to infinity, you are not uh, touching it that much. So with it, uh, uh, CCAT and beta, you will see that we can play with the degree of grooming that we want in our jet. Now, an extension of this, a few years later, is called recursive soft drop. And the idea behind this method is that, in reality, there are several decays in which you don't have two prongs. For example, top is an excellent uh, counterexample, right? So the top decay has a three prong structure, so then soft drop would not capture the third prong. Therefore, you need a recursive method to accommodate for this fact. And the recursive method is just, instead of following always the primary branch, you follow all the branches in your tree, and remove all of them that do not satisfy the soft drop condition. And this is what I am plotting here. So at the end of the day, here you went through all your tree and you end up with uh, four subjects in your jet. And you can choose how many subjects do you want at the end of the day via this parameter n. So if you put n equals to one, then you have regular soft drop, so one, uh, so two subjects at the end. And if you put n equals to infinity, this means that you have gone through all the jet, so it's the fully recursive mode, and you end up with an unknown number of subjects. So it will depend on the structure of your jet. And then n equals to two, for example, would be perfect for top decay, because you will have three prongs at the end of the day. So the two motivations to do this were um, pilot and also uh, multi-prong decays. Soft drop has been extensively used from RIC to the LHC, from proton proton to high ions. So it's part of almost now every jet analysis uh, colliders. I'm not going to go into the details of this plot, but this is just to show you that this is a tool used on a daily basis at the LHC experiment and important for both communities, for PP and AA. And of course, this is not only experimental effort, but also you can compute in perturbative QCD these soft drop groom uh, observables. Now, the point that I want to make about soft drop is uh, precisely on its very core, that is the soft drop condition. So you have uh, this CCAT and this beta. Theoretically, the choice of these two parameters gives you a flexibility. So if you remember the loom plane, by tuning this CCAT and beta, you are vetoing different regions of the loom plane. So it gives you flexibility to select uh, different kinematic regions that um, enhances the physical effects that you want to study. So you can choose these two to go to the soft and collinear region or hardcore collinear or whatever you wish. However, from a more pragmatic point of view, how do you use soft drop in a experiment? Well, you use it to remove the soft and weight angle radiation. Now, how do you know which values of zika, beta, and if you use recursive soft drop? And do you need a priori? to enhance the performance, right? So to be able to recover, for example, the mass peak at the resonance uh, value. So how this is uh, done is through, through, through tuning on an observable basis and with Monte Carlo. But this is clearly a problem where you go, well, first of all, uh, is not the most convenient way, right? To have to do it on an observable basis. But in PP collisions, at least we know that PCR uh, does a great job. But now if we describing most of less, more or less all the observables at the LNC. But if we go to heavy ions where there is no Monte Carlo established, then how do you do this procedure? Because all these tools are developed in the PP community and then you move to heavy ions and what do you do with these parameters? So people have started to realize about this and Laura gave a talk at uh, LHCP in 20, uh, this year where she plotted the 
RG distribution. So the angular separation, here I had it, the angular separation among the subjects in heavy ions. And then she realized that this uh, distribution in PCA looks like this. And when you apply it to heavy ions, it looks uh, complete. So when you embed, sorry, not in heavy ions, but when you put PCA into a heavy ion background, instead of recovering PCA, because in principle your grooming technique should be able to remove all the thermal background, instead of recovering that, you have this kind of double bump structure. Therefore, in your groom jet, you are receiving contributions from the thermal background. So what they had to do to ensure that you are not contaminated by this was to tune the CCAT in order to reproduce the uh, PCA curve more or less. Now, if you go to, instead of the RG distribution, you go to the ZG, then you have to play a similar game. So we wanted to uh, see if with a more physically motivated grooming condition, we could avoid these problems. So reduce the number of ad hoc parameters that for an experimentalist, if they have to do an analysis, is not the best thing to have. And it deals to a, it leads to a lot of confusion because people usually just use these parameters a little bit blindly, and then it's hard to to really know what are you learning from the data and that you are not biased by all these background contributions. So this was the motivation to propose dynamical grooming, and you can uh, check out more details in this paper that we put out a few months ago. And let me first go through the algorithm, how it works, and then I will motivate why are we doing this particular choice of the grooming conditions. So we start in the same way as soft drop. So we look in the Cambric agent sequence and look for the hardest branch. Now, how is the hardest branch defined? We make a combination of this uh, momentum sharing fraction. We need a PT of the subject that we are looking at and the angular separation. And we look for the maximum of this quantity in the Cambric agent sequence. Now, this quantity, maybe you are not uh, super familiar with it, but there is an angular, I'm sorry, an exponent here that is a continuous free parameter in principle. But when you set it to particular values, then you recover a more physical intuition. So if I put here a equals to two, what I am recovering is the inverse of the formation time. Therefore, I would be selecting the branch in my Cambric agent tree with the smallest formation time. And this, I'm going to call it a time drop. Because essentially, you are removing all the branches at larger formation times. Now, for a equals to 1, this is even more familiar because then you recover the kt in this, in this definition. And I will call it kt drop. And in principle, if I would set here a equals to 0, then I would be selecting on the splitting with the largest momentum sharing fraction so with the largest C, with the most symmetric one. And I would call this C drop. Now, the problem is that uh, we will see in a minute, when I set here A equals to zero, then these observables are no longer infrared and collinear safe. So A has to be small, but it cannot be zero, as I will emphasize in a bit. So once we have identified the hardest branch in the CA sequence, in the Cambric agent sequence, then we drop all branches at larger angles. So if this was our theta g, so the angular separation between the two hardest branches, then we will groom away all the branches happening at larger angles. So if I recover the Lund representation for dynamical grooming and for soft drop, let me start by soft drop because it's easier to see. So I have my set of emissions, and in soft drop I just put a hard cut, right? On the on the loop plane, I select only the emissions whose C cut, whose momentum sharing fraction C is larger than C cut times the angle to the power of beta. So this is a, and this is the same for every jet, essentially, that I'm going to do. So this is a hard cut on the phase space. Yes, so this was for trimming, right? In trimming, we also have two hard cuts in this case. Now, if we go to dynamical grooming, and this would be an example for KT drop, for example, so where we are selecting based on the KT of the splitting, that would be the y-axis over here, then I would look for the largest kt, that is this emission, and groom away everything that happens at larger angles, so uh, the green line, the green point over here. Now, for the next jet, the grooming condition would be auto-generated, right? So this 
grooming condition depends on the jet property. So it aligns a little bit more closely with how the jet substructure fluctuates on a jet by jet basis. So instead of having a hard cut, we have more like a, a continuum of cuts, as we will see later on in the in Monte Carlo. So this is a very important point to distinguish that we are not artificially cutting the phase space of our jets, but rather selecting this kind of, uh, that is why it's called dynamical grooming, right? Because it's generated on a jet by jet basis. So why this? Why do we do this hardest branch? The reason is actually one of my first slides that by doing so, so by selecting the node with the largest value of kappa and removing all the soft and wide angle radiation, also all the soft radiation that happened at larger angles, what we are doing is to remove the soft radiation sensitive to the total color charge of the jet. So this is in principle the same as what the, uh, this is motivated clearly by color coherence. So you select your hardest splitting and then, and then all the radiation that you have at larger angles is sensitive to the total, to the total color charge of the jet. And this of radiation we groom away. As I uh, emphasized before, the grooming condition is auto-generated on a jet-by-jet -jet basis. And this is going to be uh, an important point because we don't introduce sharp cuts in the phase space. And now the meaning of this parameter A is to do a more aggressive grooming with decreasing A. So essentially, if you would plot the emissions selected by time drop, KT drop, and C drop, the angles of these emissions are clearly ordered. And this you can do uh, analytically that the time drop uh, selected branching is going to happen at larger angles than KT drop and C drop. Therefore, if you remove everything that is um, earlier in the Cambridge sequence, then you are grooming more for C drop than for KT drop than for time drop. And this is a similar role as beta in soft drop. So now that we have the algorithm, let's see how can we compute observables within this framework of the dynamic algorithm. And the building block is the 2D phase spray probability for the tag dynamic algorithm splitting. So essentially, we want to know the probability of having a splitting with a momentum shared fraction zeta, uh, set and theta to be the hardest guy. How do we do this? We have a convolution of two terms. The first one is uh, given by the splitting function, sorry, by the um, coupling and the splitting function. What this term is doing is giving us the probability to split given that all other splittings are softer. And now, how do we ensure that all other splittings are softer is with a Sudakov type form factor that is giving us the probability for no emission to happen with a hardness larger than our kappa maximum. So it's easy, before I go into the expression, it's easy to see what we are doing. Over here, so we have our uh, shower, right? That is angular order. And then we identify the branch that has the, that is the hardest one. So what we are doing with the Sudakov is ensuring that all radiations happening at larger and smaller angles have a smaller uh, value of kappa on both sides. And how do we do this? By vetoing them. How do you veto with a Sudakov? So the Sudakov is just the exponentiation of this non-emission factor where you have, again, the splitting function, this very similar structure, with uh, the veto condition. That is this heavy side function that ensures that all your splittings, oh, sorry, uh, that you are vetoing the visions with values larger than your kappa. Now, the Sudakov for factor is um, use what is called veto shower, so everything is inspired by this paper. And this Sudakov for factor is infrared and collinear safe only for A larger than zero. You can see this very easily. If I set A equals to zero here, this disappears. And I have a um, collinear divergence, right? I don't have anything that regulates the theta integration. Therefore, I would have to introduce a cutoff over there. So my Sudakov for factor would no longer be infrared and collinear safe. So with this building block, and now this, you can compute it up to a, a degree of accuracy in PQCD. So you can replace the splitting function at double log accuracy and modified leading log and whatever you wish, and then start computing observables. For example, the 2D, I call it the 2D, the phase space distribution for the 
tag splitting, so by for the splitting selected by dynamical grooming, but this is nothing more than the loom plane, right? So if I and now take the pizia and do the the loom plane for C drop, KT drop, and time drop, I see this very rich structure, right? So for C drop and the uh, density is represented by the color coding over here. So yellow means that you have more points over there. So for C drop, clearly what we are doing is suppressing emissions with a small values of C. For KT drop, we are suppressing emissions with a small values of KT. And for time drop, we are cutting in this direction, right? So we are suppressing emissions with large mass. Now, first of all, this has a very rich structure, right? If I come Pair this to what I would get with soft drop. In soft drop, I just get a slice mostly uniformly populated because I am introducing this hard cut. Here you see that there is a cut, but it's dynamically generated. So there was there is no uh, barrier, right? So there is like a continuum transition from no emissions to a lot of emissions. This dynamical cut can actually be estimated analytically, and it uh, goes as the power a. So our free parameter A divided by the, by the running coupling. The point of this statement is to say that we can control things analytically. So it's not that we just see the Monte Carlo, but we can understand them from this building block that I showed you before. Now that we uh, have shown the loom place, we can start computing observables. And for example, would be the CG distribution. So you take your 2D uh, phase space and integrate over the angle. So that you only have information on the uh, C of your distribution. So we computed this uh, analytically up to modify little log, and this is what you see over here for time drop, KT drop, and C drop. So this is C drop, that is a rather like flat distribution. Then KT drop is the yellow one that grows, and then you have a cutoff. You see it over here, right? It's growing, and then it drops. And for time drop, you have the same story, but so it's a continuous growing, and then um, it falls again, but for a smaller value of C. And we can actually compute where this cutoff happens, because it's, again, dynamical, and is generated at approximately this value. So it scales as the exponential of A over alpha bar. Therefore, for a smaller value of A, it happens, for, uh, it happens at smaller values of C. And the rest of this region, is controlled by the splitting function. And this is compared to what soft drop has. So in soft drop, I'm showing here on the bottom, so it's the same distribution, but you have a hard cut. So you are selecting a split it's only with C larger than 0.1. Therefore, uh, your distribution is artificially cut and down at 0.1. So essentially, the point of this is, well, first of all, that we understand the features coming out of the plot from uh, pen and paper calculation, and also, that up to this dynamical generated cutoff, the distribution behaves as the splitting function. So if you wish, this is a way of measuring the altarelli pares splitting function down to lower values of C as compared to soft drop. We can uh, move a little bit uh, forward, and instead of just uh, doing the, let's say, partonic CG distribution, study how the underlying event and hadronization affects this distribution. So I take the PCA, now I take PCA, I compute the CG distribution at the partonic level, and then I start, and well, first of all, we have a time drop, KT drop, and C drop. And you see that the distributions look alike the analytics, right? So we have this uh, cutoff for KT drop, now C drop grows faster, but for the smaller values of C, we also have the cutoff, and these are the two distributions for soft drop the green one and the purple line for two values of the parameters. So these are both for CCAT equals 0.1, but beta equals 0 and beta equals 1. Now, when we switch on uh, the underlying event and take the ratio, so with underlying event over without underlying event, we see that, well, most of the curves behave very similarly, right? But now, more interestingly, when you uh, switch on hadronization and you take the ratio from uh, the hadron level to the parton level of this distribution, you see here the red line that is almost over the entire region of C equals to 1, meaning that KT drop is remarkably robust to hadronization. Therefore, if you would uh, compute 
this distribution analytically at the partonic level and compared to data, a very nice agreement uh, would be obtained. And actually, Alice has started, uh, has become interested by this kind of observables, and they presented the last hard probes, the experimental measurement of the CG distribution in proton-proton collisions. And this is what they see for, well, they call it dynamical grooming and A. And well, this would be C drop, KT drop, and time drop. And the conclusion from this guy was that if you uh, choose a smaller A, then you are going to larger C. But well, this is parametrically or qualitatively, this is reproduced by our plot, right? So we see here the cutoff, we see the flat distribution for the C, and we see the same for time drop. And it's, this observable is remarkably well described by uh, Pythia. They also measured the angular separation of the splitting, so not only the CG, but also the ZG, for again the th same uh, three different setups. And what they observed is essentially, it was, he summarized it as larger A means larger theta. Well, this is the same as I showed you qualitatively here, right? So the for larger values of A, your splitting occurs earlier in the cambric agent, the clustering process, therefore at larger angles. Then it will go KT drop, and then finally it goes C drop. So both CG and RG has been measured by Alice, and we can understand it pretty well by our analytical estimates. And now let me jump to a couple of different examples that instead of considering QCD jets, where we kind of settle down the stage, right? So we can do analytics and we can compare uh, to Monte Carlo and discuss the impact of hadronization and underlying event. Now we move to another type of jets that brings me or to the beginning of my talk, right? Now we're gonna uh, describe this kind of topology. So a W going to a QQ bar. Now, if I take I take these two guys, I reconstruct the mass peak of this distribution, and I, what I would expect is to get a sharp distribution around the mass of the W. That this would be the, this black line over here. You see, if, if I don't groom anything, I just get the dash black line. So this is the plane distribution that you see that is shifted to the right and smeared as compared to the groomed distribution. So now I take my jet, I apply to them dynamical grooming for C drop, KT drop, and time drop, and you see that now my distributions are way narrow and better centered at the uh, resonance value. So this would be if I characterize the distribution by the mass peak as a function of the number of pile-up interactions and this is the mass width as a function of the number of pile-up interactions. And you see that the dynamical grooming family that I am using the same colors, the mass peak is way closer to the uh, truth value as compared to the recursive soft drop mode. And the width is comparable or even smaller, right? So I'm getting out of the box. Uh, dynamical grooming is performing as good or even better as the soft drop family whose parameters were specifically tuned to give the, to give the best performance. So KT drop essentially shows an enhanced resilience against background fluctuations. So if now I go back to my problem of how to distinguish a WJet from the abundant QCD background, I'm going to use not only the mass, but the groom mass, not the plane mass, now the groom mass that I expect, as I said, a peak around the W, as I said here, but the QCD is rather flat, but also I'm going to exploit the number of hard probes on the final state. So gluon jets are more like pencil-like, so um, like a one prong, while W are two prong objects. And the um, quantity that is able to distinguish these two features is called the n subjectiveness ratio, so it's this t to one, tau to one, that is picked at the small values for the W and a rather a smooth distribution for uh, gluons. So then I take my two samples, right? My QCD jets, my gluon jets, and I count how many fall inside a mass interval, so inside a mass interval around the W peak, but with grooming, so this cut is imposed on the grooming, on the groom mass, and uh, I also impose a cut on the tau to one. And I am able to generate this plot, so essentially for different values of tau to, tau to one, I generate uh, single points in this plot. What I am showing is 
uh, the QCD mistake. So how often are we mistaken uh, from the QCD perspective? So we target as a QCD jet. And the W efficiency, that is, we are able to correctly select a W. And as these plots are a little bit hard to understand, uh, if you go from in this direction, you are doing better. So this is for the plane distribution. And now we have, uh, and as you see, that the performance is greatly improved by doing grooming. In particular, it's almost in, impossible to distinguish the soft drop line. And as I said before, tune specifically the parameters for this purpose to KT drop and tap drop. So the conclusion is that out of the box dynamical grooming delivers a comparable performance to soft drop. I'm a little bit out of time, so I'm going to jump the top part, but essentially we are able to extend also uh, to a, instead of a two prong final state, we can do also a three prong final state and get again very similar results. So this would be the money plot. Again, uh, now we are facing top discrimination, so top versus QCD discrimination. And in this case, again, KT drop performs as good as recursive soft drop. And it's a very um, straightforward extension of the method just to account for the third pro. And as some of the audience is here more interested in heavy ions than in PP, we can extend this approach, but now to heavy ion jets. And one of the questions that we ask ourselves is whether dynamically groomed substructure observables are more sensitive to uh, medium effects than traditional software. So we did only a Monte Carlo study where we take the RG distribution for uh, three different uh, jet quenching Monte Carlos, so the group in Saclay, the hybrid, and GWIL, and compute the RG distribution in PP and in led led. And you want to maximize the difference between led led and PP, right? So we do it for KT drop, that are the red and the blue lines over here, and for soft drop with the values uh, used by Alice. And you get the purple and green distributions. So now if you take the ratio between led red and PP for the KT drop distributions and for soft drop, you see that in soft drop, they merely well, the statistic is not great, but they kind of overlap all the three different jet uh, quenching Monte Carlos, while for the KT drop uh, RG distribution, then you see a huge difference among them, right? So this would be a model killer if it uh, was measured, but however, here I'm not including the thermal background that is the biggest enemy. And I didn't have to do the job because uh, James and Mateus became interested into this kind of tools and they embedded these uh, PC events into a thermal background and reconstruct the CG and the ZG in the embedded scenario divided by the truth. So ideally, this should be equal to one in both cases. And they compare a bunch of different uh, grooming methods. There is a bit of confusion in what they call uh, max C and dynamical grooming over here, because essentially what they call max C is looking for the splitting with the largest C, that this is the same as dynamical grooming with A equals zero. But I remember that this is infrared and collinear unsafe. So I would like to make the point that they chose here A equals 0.1, but essentially that is arbitrary. So A can be as small as possible, but not being zero. But well, besides, uh, that nomenclature issue, we see that the dynamical grooming method is a little bit hard to distinguish, but if we take the maximum C as the best result of dynamical grooming, this is compatible with the soft drop performance without, again, the any need for fine tuning. So let me conclude because I think I am ahead of time. Uh, I have introduced in this talk uh, dynamical grooming that is based on identifying the hardest splitting on a jet by jet basis. Just to summarize the properties of this new grooming technique is calculable and most importantly infrared and collinear safe for A larger than zero. So A being the exponent over here. It's very versatile. So we were surprised to see that it can be applied to different scenarios without fine tuning absolutely anything. And you are able to reduce the sensitivity of QCD jets to hadronization you are also able to distinguish these guys W from the gluon, and you are able also to accommodate 
these multi-pronged topologies, although I didn't have time to talk about them. And in these three cases, the method look resilient to underlying event, hadronization, and pileup, but uh, thermal background we have in heavy ions, we have to study. And finally, the, uh, this is ready to use. So if you want to do a jet analysis, even theoretically, or doing some Monte Carlo studies, you just have to go here and download it, and it's in fast jet uh, format. So thank you very much, and I will be happy to take questions.